family and friends of Katie Fleming, the Cody Institute, St. Fax alumni, distinguished guests, my fellow students at Cody, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I feel greatly honored to have been selected the 13th recipient of the Catherine Fleming International Development Award. To the award selection committee, to the women and children that I serve, specifically at the Angolo Community Development Center, SEDC in short, and Africa at large, I am extremely humbled to receive this award in recognition of the work that I do with women and children. Katie may not be here to receive my African handshake and hug, but I know that her Holy Spirit of service to humanity is standing right here next to me. And to the spirit, I say in my mother tongue, muno, muno. I love you so much. For through this award, Katie, you liveth forever. My background with children and women is probably as old as my age. It is a story that is that this appreciation speech cannot accommodate. However, a few passion shaping moments stand out for mention. I am the third born girl in my family of six girls and three boys. Born and raised in a peri urban setting. I played the role of a babysitter to my other six younger siblings. This was a typical African way of doing things. My mother had no right to stop giving birth. She needed to have boys. And so she gave birth to one, two, three, four, five, six girls. I do not know. She probably wanted to stop having children. But our society could hear none of it. Boys had to be born. So she went on. Seven, eight, and nine. And thank God for her that the last three were boys. And she could finally stop having children. <laughs> and here we are, nine siblings, from one father, one mother. What do I call that? I call it the strength of an African woman. In some kind of contradiction, my childhood embraced and opposed this babysitting responsibility. The practice of babysitting siblings planted in me the great love for children. And so I have great passion for children today. On the other hand, it took away my right to child play. So as a child, I opposed it. And I now believe that the spirit to fight for children's rights must have been planted in me at this time. I also attribute my passion for championing human rights to what my father spoke in my life. Even as society scolded and alienated him for staying with my mother after she was not able to produce a male heir after his first six children, my father stayed devoted to his family of girls. My father had an overwhelming confidence in me as a child. He spoke very, very proudly of me as a boy. He still does it to this day. 
even when he's 75 years old. He encouraged me to speak my mind. He spoke courage and bravery into my childhood. He told me to defend myself, my siblings, and my rights. I found myself having to fight several physical and verbal wars against boys and men. I thank God for these experiences. I did not know that they were preparing me for a bigger battle ahead. So as I stand before you, my testimony on inspiration will not be complete without the mention of women and mothers like Catherine Fleming. In this category stands my mother, Gladys Olieba. and my mother-in-law, um, the late Dokas Hilda Obonde, who was the founder of ACDC. At more than 60 years old, and as a pastor, leading a congregation in Nairobi. My mother is still organizing and mobilizing resources for women self-empowerment. She has remained a great inspiration to my work with children and women. <clears throat> At 81 years old, just before she died in the year 2004, my mother-in-law, Dorcas, called me to her home, her rural home, and holding my hand and looking straight into my eyes, she told me, I have recognized your gift of care and love for community work. Should I be called to heaven by the Lord? Wash my hands. Do not abandon the work of faith that I have started. You will have stripped me naked in my grave if you abandon my passion and calling on earth. <clears throat> so today, I stand before you because of several women and men of great conviction who have influenced my commitment and resolve. These are people who displayed extraordinary courage, strength, and victory against all odds. My weakness, or perhaps it is my strength, is another great source of my passion. I am a person who loves life. I love the opportunities that life presents to connect with people. I cry a lot when I meet people experiencing challenged and deprived circumstances. I hate the poverty and hopelessness that denies me the opportunity to laugh with children and women. These abhorrible situations to me turn me into a passionate fighter for justice, equity, and human rights. After 15 years, my soul, my body have conveyed hope to thousands of marginalized and vulnerable women and children. My work began after I graduated from the university in 1994 and took up a job in one of the slums in Nairobi called Kaungwari Slums. This was a very rich experience. Today I know what it means for women and children to live in the slums, in the circumstances of poor shelter, poverty, disease, HIV AIDS, and open sewer environment. 
And so I resolved to champion their rights. And if I thought that a slum was a worst case scenario for deprived women and children, then I was wrong. My next destination of duty was in 1996 in Nyanza province, a rural beach settlement near Lake Victoria. In this community, I came face to face with disinherited widows and their children. I met women fishmongers who are made sex slaves by fishermen and boat owners. Women who must sleep with HIV AIDS infected men in order to get fish to sell for basic livelihood. I met women whose children are loitering naked along the beaches. In the villages, I hugged HIV AIDS infected women who were skeletons on their deathbeds. I prayed over their fatherless children. I wept with old grandmothers who had five, six, or seven orphans to feed them from nothing. I sat and stretched my legs on the ground with emaciated widows whose property had been snatched by their in-laws. I felt the pain inflicted on the African woman by retrogressive cultures, as if I was already married, yet I was not. And so I resolved to champion gender rights. In 1998, I got married to my wonderfully supportive husband, Patrick Obonde, and as a newly wedded couple, we settled in a suburban area of Maasai land called Ngong. I soon became pregnant with my first child, Sembi, and we expected this period to be a quiet and peaceful time. But there was no peace because we learned that the neighborhood had several loitering children. These children starved most of the day. The parents of these children ritually left their shack dwellings every morning. They only came back in the sunset hours. One time we decided to entertain and give food to the loitering children. This act of compassion marked the beginning of my work in Maasai land. Within less than a week after feeding the children, our home became a play center where children could report in the morning and not leave until nightfall. I listened to the children's testimonies. I later decided to start a feeding and informal education center under ACDC. In less than two months, we had cleared the Ngong streets of more than 70 loitering children. I therefore resolved to champion children's rights. The news of my intervention in rehabilitating children spread to other parts of Maasai land. It was therefore no surprise to me when a group of Maasai women visited my home. They invited me to visit them in their manyatas. These are dome-shaped huts constructed by men using sticks and plastered with cow dung. The invitation had a sense of urgency and desperation. The subject was female genital mutilation and forced early marriages. My visit to Maasai land opened my eyes to one of the most dehumanizing cultural abuses of human rights. In the Manyatas, I met women who were treated as children by their husbands. I met women who construct their own hearts, but a woman who cannot have a say as to whom else is brought into that same heart 
as a second or third wife. I listen to narrations of pain and difficulties faced by women affected by female genital mutilation. In Maasai land, I talked to and met children who have given birth to children. I met several female children of between 12 to 14 years old who had been forced into marriages because they had gone through the FGM ritual. I met women who are prisoners in their own homes. I got to know women who cannot sit or eat with their husbands. I encountered a case of a 14-year-old girl having been forcefully married to a 70-year-old man. My visit of the Maasai Manyatas was devastating. And so, I resolved to champion the Maasai girl child and women's rights. This award that I received today is on behalf of these women. Women who are so resilient and have allowed themselves to be stretched and overstretched to the point of a breakdown. The girls who at a tender age have been made into wives, into mothers as they are household heads and are at risk as they are exposed to HIV AIDS at a very tender age. Society is driving them into prostitution, into child labor, and into crime. We have got to put a stop to this menace. This is what I will continue to engage in as the Catherine Fleming Award propels me to the next level. This award will not change who I am, but it will reveal who and what I am because I see my hopes, desires, and dreams being achieved through this award. Life is made up of small comings and goings. And for everything we take with us, there's something that we leave behind. Katie left behind a powerful legacy. A legacy to serve the less fortunate in Africa, the poorest of the community, the women and children. I never met Katie. However, in designing Katie's spirit and seeing the outpouring of love being demonstrated by her family and friends, I feel I know Katie. In Katie, I see a woman who must have conquered the human ego. I design a woman who chose to decrease herself and to increase others. I see a selfless daughter, wife, mother, and friend. A family kingdom builder. Katie must have believed in higher values values higher than manipulation, money, and material. Katie have, must have mastered the keys to building durable and quality relationships. To honor Katie, I will be an ambassador of these great virtues. I promise to entertain virtuous thoughts. And if I will speak, of which I must speak, I shall speak truth in place of lies, love in place of hate, praise in place of criticism, virtue in place of vice, justice instead of injustice, honesty in place of dishonesty, good reports in place of negative reports. Change is slow, but I strongly believe it will eventually come. Even if it's not through me, we need to plant seeds of social justice. And today is about possibilities, 
as I honor Katie's work in Africa. The possibility that a girl can be born and grow up in safe neighborhoods with a loving family around her. That she can equally and equitably access education and all the other basic rights with no hindrances whatsoever. That she can fully participate and make decisions concerning her reproductive health, choose who and when to marry, and the number of children to have. And that she is respected as she is and is also involved in decision making at all levels. By receiving this award, I will always remain committed to Katie's spirit of love, care, and family. If I had an opportunity to write an epitaph on Katie's tombstone, I could have borrowed a quote from my husband. On the tomb, we would have written, here is an honorable woman who believed in the greater value in we than I. May her spirit live forever. Thank you all. God bless you. Asante sana.